Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the next one in our series of uh, Celebration of Faculty Careers, Colloquia. And uh, as uh, I have briefly mentioned in the past, this is a kind of a new uh, series that we started in the college to celebrate the accomplishments of the senior faculty. So every Every full professor who has been a full professor for seven years or more, every seven years, is supposed to uh, have the opportunity to present uh, one of these and, uh, and be able to share with you their uh, experiences and their wisdom as a faculty member. And so today, we're very pleased to have Professor Subrio Data, who is uh, the Thomas Duncan Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And uh, I will not go through a lengthy introduction because you all know he's one of our indeed most distinguished faculty members. And uh, I will just say that for the sake of this program's integrity, he was promoted in 1988 to full professor, so he qualifies. So with that, <laughs> I will have Professor Dana. Thank you for the introduction and uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's the year I think I got tenure. <laughs> and at that time what I remember was before that I'd worked on something totally different. I used to work on acoustic wave devices. And so I got tenured, I figured this was a good time to try something different. And I was looking around for things to do and that's when I went to a seminar, maybe somewhat like this, and someone said, but you know, this looks like a very interesting field. You know, these devices are getting smaller, and if you look at this active re region, length, today is a few microns, and who knows, one of these days it might even be less than a micron. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have sub-micron devices someday. Well, of course, now in hindsight, we know what happened. <laughs> it became sub-micron, then sub-100 nanometer, and we are now talking of whether it will become sub 10 nanometer, I guess. And what has always driven this is the, is this need to miniaturize. That is how to make the transistor or resistor or your device component smaller and smaller so that you can pack more of them into a chip. So I guess this is kind of the shortest length, the length of this active region of a device. So what I've showed here is a very simple device, like you have a channel with two contacts, so basically it's a resistor. So you apply a voltage, you get a current. And what would make it a transistor is if I had put in a third terminal with which you could control the resistance. But all that we don't really need for what I'm talking about today. So I've kept it very simple. And this tells you the smallest dimension. And actual footprint of the transistor is, of course, somewhat bigger. And you can see in these 30 years, it's gone down by, let's say, a factor of 100. So what that means is each thing, the dimension is going down by 100. So it means you can pack 10,000 more things in there. So in those days, you had large-scale integration probably, which would, which may, which would mean, say, 100,000 transistors, 10 to the 5. Today, it's a factor of 10 to the power 4 more. We talk of a billion transistors. That's roughly happened. And what people are debating is what happens after this. And as you know, we are getting awfully close to atomic dimensions, as you can see. <clears throat> but that's not what I'll be talking about. That part of it, like where it goes, that's all pretty speculative. That's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is just the, our basic understanding of current flow and how, it, how you control it, how that has evolved and how that has been influenced by what we know today that we didn't know before. Okay, and I hope you'll find this interesting. Uh, so what we knew back in 1984 was Ohm's law. 
voltage divided by current, that's resistance. That was the explanation. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, and the resistance depends on the length of your conductor and pro inversely proportional to the area of the cross section. And then there's something called resistivity. That's the material property. It's inverse is the conductivity. And there's theories for what, the, what determines that resistivity or conductivity. That's okay. Now, in another five years after this, by 1989 or 1990, we learned something else, something that was completely new at that time. And that is that if you got to really short conductors, so that as electrons go through your channel, instead of going through diffusively, like a random walk, which is what things were when it was big, if it, you could actually go through ballistically, ballistically means like a bullet, then the resistance would be given by something like this. this. H over Q squared, that's what nowadays in the literature has become quite common. You see it everywhere. This is quantum of resistance. And the value is about 25 kilo ohms. And the resistance of a ballistic conductor then is this H over Q squared, 25 kilo ohms, times 1 divided by a number. And guess what that number is? I'll try to explain it as we go along a little bit. There's this. And this is what was, I guess, what happened in 1988 was there was a couple of groups who reported this experimentally. And before that, there was actually lots of debate about this. People were arguing, what is really the resistance of a very short conductor? And of course, if you start from here, this Ohm's law from 1884, you would have said it must go to zero when you make it really long. And so between 1984 and 1990, we heard lots of arguments about this. You know, what exactly would it be? And now, of course, the answer is very clear. But, and one thing I often mention, uh, I use this as a good example of how important experiments are. Because we had very good logical arguments back in the 80s about what it should be. But it all got very clear, of course, once the experiments came along. Now, what we realized in a few years, that is, that although these two look totally different, you could actually connect the two. That is, if you had a long conductor where actually electrons travel in a random walk, then you can define something called a mean free path. And the length of the channel divided by the mean free path, that's what's here, 1 plus this times that. That's what would describe a long conductor. So you drop the 1, and you kind of get back the Ohm's law type of thing. That's proportional to length. On the other hand, if your conductor is short, you drop this, then you get back the ballistic thing. So you see, you get a nice clean picture from this direction. And what I feel is, that this is a very clear picture that I understand easily. On the other hand, as you know, what usually happens when people write books, when people discuss all this is, they know this. And so they figure out how to write one section so that they can bring this in. So in other words, they would rather go from what they know from below. And I feel that that tends to obscure a lot of physics, make things look unnecessarily complicated. Yeah. Whereas what you might call a bottom-up view is a whole lot clearer, whole lot more logical. And the only reason it has never happened is because historically it was the other way. It's just that back in 1984, no one knew this answer. And so it made perfect sense to start your discussions where you know the answers. But now that we know all the answers, I would argue it's really much clearer this way. And you kind of almost need to do that in order to move on and really go on to the next level. That's what I'd argue. Now, to get started, I just need to get a couple of concepts down. And it's really just this one slide about concept. And just so you have this picture clear, I've also drawn it out there on the blackboard. So that when I move on, you still have that up there. Okay? That when you want to describe current flow through anything, so first let's think of equilibrium case, which means you have the channel, you have two contacts, 
and you have just shorted the whole thing, no current flows. And the first thing you should draw is what is called this energy level diagram. That is, this channel has certain energy levels available to it. So what we all know is like, if you take a hydrogen atom, you have a 1s level and a 2s level and 2p level and so on. If you go to molecules, the levels get denser. When you get to bigger solids, levels are even denser. So if I'm drawing levels here, I'd be kind of drawing lines all day. So what's much more convenient is to talk about a density of states. That how many levels do I have per unit energy? So around here, you got lots of levels per unit energy. Around here, you have none. So that's what you call energy gap. You say, well, there's a gap, no levels here. You got lots of levels here, etc. And you got again lots of levels here. So, so that's the first picture you need to draw, this density of states picture. How do you know it? Experimentally, what you do is usually one of the common experiments is photoemission experiments. Any new solid, hit it with light, see how much energy it takes to knock an electron out of the solid photo emission. And that kind of, so the vacuum level is somewhere up here. Vacuum means when an electron is out of the solid. And when the electron is inside the solid, the energy is less. These are all kind of negative energies compared to the vacuum. And these are all, so you look at what energy it took, what h nu of photon it takes to knock it out. So that's how kind of experimentally you know things. Theoretically, you try to model it in various ways. And starting point would be some version of Schrodinger equation usually. Okay. Now the other thing you need to know is where is the electrochemical potential or Fermi level? And I use those words kind of almost interchangeably. And what that tells you is that at low temperatures, up to what point would all the levels be filled? Because you have a certain number of electrons and they're trying to go to the lowest energy level, energy states, and you might think that, well, they would probably all be down here well, not quite because of the exclusion principle, that every level holds only one electron. And so, if you have 10,000 electrons, you kind of need to fill 10,000 levels. And so that sort of determines where the electrochemical potential at equilibrium should be in any solid. And that's what I write as mu. So that's the diagram I've drawn. And when you apply a voltage across it, then it's like the two contacts are held at two different electrochemical potentials. And they're separated by the amount of this applied voltage. And so this is the basic thing I wanted to mention before we can talk about the question of interest, which is you know, why electrons flow in the first place. That's, of course, what current flow is about, why electrons flow. And that's where what I'd argue is that the reason is simple. It's like this. You look at these states here. These states are below this Fermi level, or electrochemical potential, and so this contact wants to fill it up. On the other hand, this contact has its electrochemical potential here, so this contact wants to empty it. So you've got these two big contacts, which have totally different agendas. One wants to fill it up, one wants to empty it. So what happens is, the left one fills it up, and the right one, as soon as it finds out, of course, empties it. Okay, and that just goes on forever. Another one comes in, goes on. I mean, no one's going to give up. He's going to keep filling it up. He's going to keep emptying it. And what what, when it empties it, of course, it will go out the external circuit and a new one will come in. So that's basically what current flow is about. See? Now, one important question in all this that I want to stress is that always a question comes up, what about all these levels down here? Why don't they conduct? When trying to understand how current flow, do I have to worry about them? And the answer is you really don't. What's way below the chemical potential doesn't matter. Why? Well, very simple. It's like when you look at these levels, this contact would really like to keep them filled because it's below mu1. This contact would also like to keep it filled because it's mu below mu2. So there's complete agreement, it just stays filled. That's it. Nothing more happens thereafter. Now, this is the point that causes a lot of confusion. So as I said, even last year I saw questions in, I think, physics today. A reader was asking, why are filled bands inert? Why don't filled bands conduct? And you can look at the answers that came. I mean, I don't think I can follow what they're talking about, really. See? 
So just this elementary point, and the reason it causes so much confusion is, of course, usually you say, why do electrons move? Well, because there's an electric field. You know, that sound counts naturally. Electric fields exert a force. That's why electrons move. Well, if electric field is what drives electrons, then every electron should be moving, essentially. This electric field, everyone feels it. So that's what causes the whole confusion at that point. And the point, this is why I say that, I want to make the point that what really drives it is this difference in agenda. Because this contact wants to fill it up, that contact wants to empty it. Okay. Now, let's try to make this a little quantitative now. That what is the current as a function of voltage? That's what you'd call the conductance. So you can go to the next one. So here what I could say is that, well, there is this energy range of QV where electrons keep coming in and going out. So if you look here, what is the density of electrons? What is the number of electrons? Well, it's the density of states. That tells you how many states per unit energy times QV. And they are half filled. Half filled because, you see, one contact wants to fill it up. The other contact wants to empty it. So on the average, it's basically half filled. So the number of electrons in the channel is that much. And that you can equate to the current that flows times the time. And if you do that, you get a nice expression for conductance. It just follows simply. Now this argument, you see, has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's a perfectly simple semi-classical argument. In fact, I'd come, I've often used this analogy. That if you wanted to know how many PhD students we have in our program, one way to think about it is how many students graduate per year and how many years everyone spends here. You see, if you have 100 per year, everyone takes five years, we'd have about 500 students on the average. So that's about the argument, really. How many electrons in the channel? That's how many students in your program. It's about how many are going long per second, how much time they spend in the channel. That's about it. Right, right. I'm glossing over that. So in general, everything I'm discussing, I'm assuming a very small voltage and at low temperatures. Now, if you wanted to do it right, in a way you kind of anticipated, is that in general, what you could do is write the current as a difference between the Fermi function here and the Fermi function here. So Fermi function tells you if it is occupied or not. So 1 means occupied, 0 means unoccupied. Same here. So F1 minus F2. Down here, no current flows because both are 1. Around here, it flows because 1 and 0. Now, this way, you can actually include temperature also into the discussion because the Fermi function has temperature in it, et cetera. And what is the important Assumption here is that there is no energy loss in the channel. And that's a very important physical thing, which again causes a lot of debate. So I'll get into that. But because if there's no energy loss in the channel, so electrons, whatever energy they come in, they go through straight, and then they get out. And in that case, you see every energy is independent. So you can write the current at a given energy, integrate. And then you have the total current. So something like this, integrate over energy, and you're done. That's the simple. That's the simplicity that comes from it, making that assumption. But otherwise, this is it. Okay. So just to keep things simple then, I'll be focusing on this one instead of trying to bring in the Fermi functions and do it as a function of temperature and all that stuff. So this is the one I want you to remember. Now what I want to show next is how this one leads, could be used for understanding ballistic conductance and diffusive conductance. Now, First thing to note is that this density of states when you go to big conductors depends on the volume. That is, if I take a solid, make it, I said earlier that the hydrogen atom has some levels, H2 would have twice as many levels in a given energy range. And gradually, of course, as you go to big conductors, this is more correct. That is, if you make something twice as big, there'll be twice as many states. In fact, usually for big conductors, you say, what is the density of states per unit volume? Now, so this is proportional to the volume. Now, the conductance, of course, cannot be proportional to the volume. You kind of expect it finally has to be something like Ohm's law. Now, that's where you bring in the time. 
Now, if you have ballistic conductor, then you say, okay, the time is proportional to the length, length divided by velocity. Very simple. Ballistic, so. So now you see the L cancels out, and so what you expect is that the conductance should be proportional to area. And that's kind of true of ballistic conductors, that if you make the cross-sectional area bigger, the ballistic conductance would be bigger, but it really is independent of the length. And nowadays, people have done lots of experiments on short conductors. And yeah, if you, if you have really a ballistic transport, you can make it twice as long, same current, same conductance. So what you'd expect then is the conductance proportional to area. And this is what you'd call the, I think, this was noted around 1969 or 70, often referred to as the Sharvin resistance, actually. But what got this a lot of attention was around 1988, where they saw the quantized version of this. Quantized version meaning, instead of having this linear thing, they saw steps. And that happened when you made the cross-sectional area sufficiently small. So when you make it sufficiently small, that's when you see this conductance going in steps as you change the area, essentially. And as I say, the first experiments was in gallium arsenide. Since then, this has been done with all kinds of materials. Actually, people have even measured conductance of a hydrogen molecule, for example, something really small. And they've looked at metallic wires, semiconductors, all kinds of things. And you see this, actually. And the way you could understand it is something like this. Now, this stood that if you consider a one-dimensional wire of any kind, then regardless of the details, you can show that the dense time, the transfer time getting from one end to the other, divided by the density of states, is equal to h. h meaning the Planck's constant. Now, the way you'd, I do it in my course is we'd actually go through a model of how you calculate density of states. But that I'm not going into at this point. Sometimes people justify this as an uncertainty principle. They say, well, you know, you got this electron going through, and if there's some uncertainty in time, and the density of states is, they would relate it to some uncertainty in energy. They say, well, one level, how much is it spread in energy? And then they would say, this is like delta T times delta E. So that's how sometimes people justify it. But what I find most convincing is, you know, looking at specific models and seeing exactly how it works. Anyway, so the point is that for a 1D conductor, regardless of the details, this is like H. And when you have a bigger conductor, not a 1D, somewhat bigger, then it's H times a number. And that number actually tells you, you called it the number of modes. It's like tells you how many wavelengths of your electron fit into the cross section. So that's this one. And then you see you get a ballistic conductance, that would be M times Q squared over H, which would fit this. And the only thing I'd add to it is that yeah, this kind of lets you think of your actual conductor as lots of 1D channels in parallel. How many? Well, M, M of them, number of modes, M of them. And experimentally, that M is like a, is always an even integer usually here. It's this 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. And that two has to do with the two spins. The idea that levels usually in non-magnetic materials are all spin degenerate. So when I said 1D conductor, even a 1D conductor kind of has these two spins, like two things in parallel, and so the conductance is twice as big, basically. Anyway, so this is what you, and this now, as I said, has been seen a lot in all kinds of systems. Now, what about diffusive conductance? Now, that's where, of course, we'd really like to, we'd expect to see Ohm's law, not a conductance that's proportional to area. You should have area divided by length. And this is where you'd have to invoke, you could see that the time for to get through a region, if the transport is diffusive, if you're taking this random walk, of course, instinctively, you feel you take a lot longer. But one of the important results in random walk theory is that this time is now proportional to L squared rather than L. So the time it takes to get through a certain length is L squared divided by the diffusion coefficient. That's, I put a D bar on this because to distinguish it for density of states, since I use D already for density of states. So that would be this T. Now if you combine those two, you'd get conductance is equal to area over length, as you expect from Ohm's law, 
and then q square density of states per unit volume that is independent of volume that is right and the density and the diffusion coefficient. So, that then tells you this is the conductivity and with a little discussion you could also show that you could write the conductivity in the form modes per unit area times the mean free path. But the form you would usually see in the literature is this one. So, this is not a new result it is known it is just the way I got it is different. But this is a, this is a well known result though that has been the conductivity depends on density of states and diffusion coefficient. It is just that no one usually carries this in their head because the usual derivation of this requires I guess this Boltzmann equation which takes a lot more background. So, if you take any solid state physics text what you would have in chapter 1 is this one the Drude formula. It says conductivity depends on q square times the number of free electrons mean free time divided by the mass. That is what you would have in chapter 1 of I mean this would be in freshman physics. This is what you would see. This one would be somewhere in chapter 15. You know after you have understood Boltzmann equation and all the effort that goes into all that. Net result is and everyone agrees with this they believe in it. But most of them do not carry this in their head use this to guide their thinking or any of that. So, you usually have to remind them about that one. But the thing is that this is really more correct because this is more general this is more correct this is more generally applicable. Whereas, this one kind of gets you in you know works a lot of times of, uh, as you might expect, but gets you in trouble in many contexts. So, let me explain what I mean by that. So, you see the things that enter here you will see is number of free electrons mean free time that is simple mean free time that is what clear there is a number of free electrons and there is a mass. Now, the mass itself causes some problems because you see this is not the mass of an electron it is the mass of the electron in the solid. And usually this energy momentum relation is par parabolic which means there is a well defined mass. But in graphene for example, one of the materials where there is a lot of discussion is because E versus P looks linear. It looks this like this relativistic thing and then it is not clear exactly what to use for mass for example. So, that but that you could a kind of account for easily, but it is the one that I have find conceptually the hardest to explain and there is another issue I will come up with we will discuss it is this number of free electrons. So, consider solid where the density of states still looks like this. This is about what it is for graphene for example. It goes up goes and so this is the part where it is filled usually the Fermi energy would be somewhere around here. Now, question is what would its conductivity be? If I put a if the Fermi energy happens to be here well it should conduct well because it is up here there is a lot of density of states and it should also conduct well if the Fermi energy happens to be here for example, and then lot of density of state. But the question is how do you apply the root formula to it? The way people do it is they say well if it is here then the number of electrons that you should use is this one this one. These are the free electrons you should not include anything down here because again filled bands do not conduct whatever etcetera. But exactly where do you draw the line that is not com completely clear. Now, sometimes in solids you have a nice gap in which case it is clear you kind of draw a line where you draw the line, but in graphene you know there is no real gap there it is not even clear where to draw the line. So, so this is what they would use. Now, how do you explain this one because this one actually has free less electrons see, but it conducts better than something with its Fermi energy here. So, that is where you invoke holes you say well you know field bands do not conduct, but then you have empty states and they conduct and so you bring in the holes. Okay, but you see none of this was needed if you just looked at the density of states and used this. So, this all these complicated arguments that come up as soon as you start trying to understand theory of current flow, which I feel are kind of due for there for historical reasons, really not that I mean should should not cause any confusion if you had just looked at this in the first place. But the other issue that actually I feel is really important is 
all of this then is based on the idea that electrons flow because of an electric field rather than this chemical potential that I was talking about. So, and that comes from how you actually derive this Drude formula, the freshman physics formula. And that is you start from Newton's law, you said m dv dt is force, force is q times the electric field. I'm using f for field so that because I used u e for energy. And then you say, well, there's always a frictional term. And then at steady state, we can drop that. So that tells you that the steady state velocity would look something like this, which you can then put into current, and you'll get current density is equal to field times the conductivity. So that's the formula you'd see, usually. And so you look for conductivity on the web, definitions. Everywhere you'd see J equals sigma F, electric field. And yet, people who work on this, they know that you, know, that you shouldn't take that too seriously. Current doesn't really depend on the electric field, or electric field is proportional to the electrostatic potential. Current really depends on electrochemical potential. It's got nothing, not the electrostatic one. And so, the correct expression should really be, it's the gradient of the electrochemical potential. And again, people who work in the field, it's not like anyone would dispute that. It is just that, because this is what we carry in our head, this is what we write, and this is what's everywhere, actually. Now, I always make the point that, you know, you can see how important this is just by looking at a very common device, this PN junction. So PN junctions have, I mean, actually, not just PN junctions, any two dissimilar materials, whatever they are. If you bring them together, there's a space charge right near there. Because anytime you bring two dissimilar materials, what happens is, to start with, they have different chemical potentials, and so a few electrons spill over. Spill over, and this side gets charged, and then it floats up. And that's how it comes to equilibrium. So there's always some space charge here. What that means is there's always an electric field. There's always an electrostatic potential. And, but then you can't use it for anything. There's no current. It's an equilibrium. Not like you could use it to generate energy or anything of that sort at all. But usually, you think of homogeneous materials, and in a homogeneous material, you could argue that, well, mu and phi are kind of parallel, so instead of this, I could use this. And that usually works, which is why no one runs into major problems. But it's just that when you're talking of things on an atomic scale, nothing is homogeneous. You're talking of you know, atoms with enormous electric fields all over the place. And you know, you're trying to talk about current flow through a hydrogen molecule. So which electric fields to include and which ones not to? Not completely clear, you see. And that is why what I feel is it's really important then to think in terms when talking of current flow in these terms rather than in terms of electric field, the way we talk of heat flow. You know, heat flow, there's no confusion. It depends on the gradient of the temperature. In my mind, electrochemical potential is a similar thing, just like temperature. When everything's in equilibrium, Temperature has to be the same. When everything's in equilibrium, electrochemical potentials have to be the same. And here, luckily, because phonons are not charged particles, there isn't a corresponding electrostatic potential to confuse us. So there is nothing else to get confused by. Whereas in this case, for historical reasons again, as I said, this tends to dominate people's thinking about how electric fields are driving the current. Now, the approach I described a little earlier, and is that in a current proportional to F1 minus F2, there you see it is really related to the occupation of things, which is related to the electrochemical potential. So it would naturally give you current expressions that would be more like this, because electric field is never the driving term in that whole discussion. See? Now, one question you could ask is then that if I really had a short channel, like a ballistic conductor, what would this electrochemical potential look like inside the channel? Because one thing we know is in a 1D problem, uniform conductor, you must have the same current, and so d mu dx must be constant, which means it must look like a straight line. That's something, that's textbook, just like temperature. If you had two different temperatures, in between it would go like a straight line. Sure. Now what would it look like in a ballistic channel? 
And this is something that nowadays you can do experimentally because you can, you have scanning probes with which you can actually move along and see how the mu varies. And these are experiments that were done, I'd say, late 90s. So back in the early 90s, these experiments still weren't quite there. But now people can do that and they measure this. And what they see is usually something like this. In a ballistic conductor, it drops suddenly, stays flat inside, and then drops again. Now, if you interpret it this way, you'd say there's enormous d mu dx here. Of course, it's a series circuit, so current's the same everywhere. So if this is big, that must be small. So it means right here I must have a big resistance conceptually. So it is like I could view this as, as if my ballistic resistance is like this interface resistance. It's really associated with the interfaces. It's not the middle. And so, and that, as I said, kind of goes along with what we had taught from Ohm's law, that a real ballistic thing shouldn't have a resistance. And here it is like, yeah, that's kind of true. There is nothing here, which is why you can make it longer and you still get the same thing, because the resistance is really associated more with the ends, where things change, where you go from the contact into this thing. And in practice, of course, usually it's hard to get to a fully ballistic thing. So what you see is things like this where it has some slope here, but you have a discontinuity at the two ends. See? And actually Mark was telling me the other day that, Mark Lundstrom, that you know, he was looking at a lot of the heat transport literature where people are talking of actually temperature steps like this. It's very similar. Again. That at the two ends of a really short thing, you've got temperature steps, and they're talking of how the Fourier law doesn't work for small solids, <coughs> short things. Now, here again, you could visualize this as your usual interface resistance, and then the actual resistance in between. This is the Ohm's law part of it, the part that we knew before. And what we have now understood is how to get these. Now, how do you understand then this sudden drop? Now, that's where what I'd like to say is there's one picture that usually helps get some insight, and that is if we recognize that inside the channel, actually rather than one potential, you actually have two. One that is associated with electrons going to the right, and another that's associated with electrons going to the left. And if you're doing heat, I'd say the same with phonons. Phonons going to the right are at a different temperature from phonons going to the left. So you could call this mu plus, and call that mu minus. And then you might say, well, but then didn't you say we measured this? Uh, if you had these two of them, why are we measuring this? And there my answer would be that, well, when you measure something, what you're really doing is you're connecting this yellow thing to two different groups of states. One has a potential, let's say, one. The other has a potential zero. And there is some resistance here. And what it does is your probe floats to some potential such that there is no current out of the thing, because it's a floating thing. I mean, that's the voltmeter, so no current should flow through that. So there's no current out of it. So whatever current flows in here has to come back out here. So one drives some current in, same thing must come out. And based on that, you could figure out that the that yellow thing should float to a, so that voltage. If this is one and this is zero, that's what you should get. So if the two resistances are equal, which is usually the case when you're putting in this probe, it connects equally to positive states and negative states. And so you basically get 0.5. So if this is 1, that's 0, you get 0.5. So that's what you're measuring. Now, why should one group of states have a totally different potential than the other? The argument I often use is that, well, it's kind of like this. You have this one group of states. When you look down from the top, you've got one group of states flowing this way, another group flowing this way. And electrons, when they come into the, from the contact, they go into these. And this is the contact that's full. It's got lots of electrons there. This is the contact that's empty, so it has nothing that it can supply over here. So this is all empty, that's all full. So it's like this is at the same potential as that one. This is at the same potential as that one. So sometimes I've used this analogy that, you know, if you looked on I-65, usually you'd have as many cars going from Lafayette to Chicago as from Chicago to Lafayette. But if you had a situation where something big was happening in Chicago, 
you had lots of people lined up and Lafayette trying to get there, then of course all the northbound lanes would be filled, all the southbound lanes would be empty. And that's about it. So it's kind of like that. Lots of things coming in from here, northbound lanes are filled, southbound lanes are empty. But it still bothers people because you know this whole idea of having two temperatures at the same place. Because usually, as you know, if you heat up your food in, micro, in a microwave, you know, often the top is hot, but the inside is cold. And that's because you say, well, it, it's de delivering the heat in a localized way, and it's not flowing from one to the other. But this is more subtle. It's like you're at the same place, but you have one group of states or one certain degrees of freedom that are at a different temperature from another one. And the way it would happen is if your method of excitation kind of delivers its energy kind of preferentially to one group than the other. So here also the same thing, that one group of states getting fed from here, and so they're well fed, the other one's empty. That's okay. But what we have often wondered is whether there would be a way of directly measuring that. Because, and as I said, this, is, this makes it look more reasonable and all that, but how do you directly measure this? Now, that's where, I guess it brings me to the other topic I wanted to talk about, about spin. By the way, I'm almost done. But I number all my slides backwards. So this one kind of, this number tells you, see how many more you have to listen to. <laughs> I'm getting there, okay? not too far. Okay. Now, see, usually, as I said earlier, states all come in pairs, so there is a, upspin and the downspin. So when I say this on I-65, you have all these northbound lanes and southbound lanes. Thing is, if you looked carefully, the northbound lanes would have some upspin lanes and some downspin ones, red and blue. Same here, there'd be a red and a blue. And that's the usual situation. Now, one of the very important discoveries of the last five years is, you'll see this word a lot, this topological <coughs> insulators. And what was predicted and observed experimentally is that in a certain class of materials under the right conditions, and bismuth telluride is one example of these materials, when you look at the surface, this, you don't have all these four. What you have is just two of them. So what goes to the right is all upspin. What goes to the left is all downspin. So usually you see states would come in pairs, and here also it's kind of in pairs. So there's always this time-reversed pair. But upspin going to the right, its pair is downspin going to the left. And normally you'd also have downspin going to the right and upspin going to the left. But in these materials at the surface, you'd have a situation like this. And at the opposite surface, it's reversed. So the two missing ones are kind of on the other surface. So these are all surface states, actually. So the surface states have this very interesting property. So what that means is, of course, in a material like this, what I'm calling mu plus could be called the potential of the upspins. And what you call mu minus could be called the potential of the downspin. You see? So that you could call that a spin voltage, spin potential. It's like ups, difference between potential between up and down. And as I said, this. The experimental confirmation was around 2008 or so, and those experiments are all again photo emission types. The way you do it is hit it with light, look at the electrons that come out, and you, what the experiment showed was indeed the electrons that come out traveling in this direction had a spin in a certain direction. Those that came out going the other way had the spin opposite. So that was the experiment, but those are photo emission experiments. And what people have been trying to do is find electrical experiments that would actually show this. Okay? And so what we thought was, well, you have this spin voltage. If you could measure this, that would be a good, a good indication of what we are talking about. And of course, in that old model then, the two resistances, one is the resistance of upspins, and the other is the resistance of downspins. Because the ones that are going to the right are all upspins. One that are going to the left are all downspins. Now, the question is, is there some way to control that? Because originally the problem was both were usually equal and you always got halfway. But how could we make it? And that's where there is this another important development in spintronics, and that is this magnetic contacts. But that's an older development, actually. That's more, I'd say, more like 15, 20 years. 
what people found is that if you had a contact that was a magnet, then if the magnet pointed in the same direction as your spin, you'd have a lower resistance. And if the magnet pointed opposite, you'd have a higher resistance. So what that means is, yeah, so if you have up spin or down spin, if it's up spin, this would be a lower resistance, so you'd measure more like one. If it's down spin, this would be the lower resistance, and you'd measure more like zero. So that's how you could kind of measure this and this in a way. And so, now the question would come up is, so what is the direction of the spin here? Because we are saying the magnet has to point along up. And the thing is that in these materials, what is going in this direction, if this is the surface, the direction of the spin is the direction of flow cross the di direction normal to the surface. So the spin is in this direction. So it's along the y direction if we use that coordinate system. And so what we had proposed was that if you measure the voltage with a magnet pointing in some direction, the voltage in the opposite direction, then the difference would be the spin potential. It would be proportional to the current, the ballistic resistance of the channel, and it depends on this magnetization direction dot with y. So if m happens to be in y direction, that's when this would be positive. If m is negative, y it would be negative, etc. So this is, and this, I guess, last month, I, I guess, there was this paper in Nature Nano where there was an experiment which sees something that's more or less understood in terms of this, this formula. And that's kind of a very nice thing. So if you do theory, you know one of the nicer things is when some experiment actually looks like what you think it should be. So most of the time it often doesn't. So anyway, so this is a, a kind of supports the description I've been, the story I've been telling you. And What's more, the spin voltage then. So the point I want to make is that there's a spin voltage. If you run a current this way, you see a spin voltage in the y direction. And uh, I said about these topological insulators, but the similar thing is also seen in a wide class of materials also, where here things are about a, the surface states, but there are other materials with this huge spin orbit coupling where you see something similar. Namely, if you run a current, you see a spin voltage. This is metals like tantalum, for example. That, but this is also, again, something that's happened in the last 10 years, that people have seen all this. Now, what could you do with spin voltages? Well, you could drive spin currents. What do I mean by that? Well, if you had a magnet sitting there, there's no current into it. But there's a spin current into it. Why? Because there's no current because what flows in from this thing comes back here, and you left it floating, so it adjusts so there's nothing. But what is flowing in is upspin. What is coming back is downspin. So it's like if you had positive charges going this way and negative charges coming back at you, there would be a net current, of course. Similarly, if you have positive spins going in and negative spins coming back, there's a spin current. No real current, though. I mean, no charge current. And that brings up the question, so are spin currents real? What Could you do something with it? And the answer is actually yes. That's again another development in this field is you could use spin currents to actually turn a magnet. So if you had enough spin current going in, you could actually flip that magnet. So what's a, a magnet is a material in which all the electronic spins are locked in a particular direction because of internal interactions, something like this. And then if you had a current flow, electrons flowing, then there is the spin current in this direction, which goes and hits the magnet, comes back with its spin reversed, then hits it again, comes back with its spin reversed, again hits it again, and so on. And every time it hits, it kind of flips one of the spins in the magnet. And the point is, if the current exceeds a certain critical value, then it will actually be able to even flip the entire magnet. Now, that won't happen, of course, if the magnet was a thick one. But if it is like two nanometers thick, these nanomagnets, then you can actually flip it with spin currents. And that's this very important, another important development, what's called the spin transfer torque. Another important thing that has been discovered again in the last 10, 15 years. And what is surprising here is that you see 
if you looked at the spin current, it's actually bigger than your charge current because charge current was just one electron went from here to here. But it kind of hit it many times. And every time it hit, it kind of delivered one electron worth of spin to it. And so you actually have a bigger spin current there. And people are now talking of, are looking at insulating magnets. That is, here usually the magnet is iron, something that's conducting. But the point is there are also insulating magnets, like YEG, yttrium ion garnet, so which actually don't conduct. And so if you actually looked at the charge conductance, it would be zero. But it could still have a spin conductance. See? And some of that has been experimentally observed. And people are trying to see if they can actually flip mag insulating magnets like this. So lots of developments in this field in general, you see, which I've kind of tried to put them here. And I actually haven't mentioned the most important one, which is this magnetic tunnel junction. I didn't even come to that. So there's lots of these things. And then there's spin voltages, spin currents, and how spin currents can turn a magnet. So you can imagine making you know, spin circuits with these internal spin voltages and currents. And these spin voltages and currents are kind of little different from what we learn in 201. It's like there's a charge component, but then there's a spin component. The spin component is a vector. But the point I want to mention, come back to again, the theme is, it's very hard to understand what a spin potential means if you think of potential as electric fields. Because then there's only one thing. There's only the electrostatic <coughs> potential. It doesn't matter whether it's upspin, downspin, what species you're talking about, none of that. But once you think in terms of electrochemical potential, it's like every species has a different potential. And then you can control different species differently, which is what happens in a lot of biological systems, really. Okay? So, the point I'm trying to make again is that one needs to get away from this idea that fields are what really drive electrons or electrons. And now just a couple of things then that how would you calculate something like this? One of these diagrams, are the current flow in the ballistic regime. Well, the model I described to you earlier, that assumes there is no energy loss in the channel at all. So electron goes from here to here without losing any energy. And what bothers a lot of people then is that, well, anytime there's a resistance, there must be an I squared R loss. There must be some joule heating. So where's the heat? And what we now know is that, well, ideally, all that heating could be at the two ends. And there's experimental evidence that that's what happens. What gets hot is the ends. And my friend Ashraf often says that, well, you know, when a bullet hits something, you know, all the energy goes into the, what it hits not into the medium that it flies through. So then from that point of view, you can kind of understand. It's just that we're usually thinking of viscous medium where it's the medium that gets hit. Right? And so, look, okay. now, but this assumption actually makes an enormous simplification in the whole thing because the process of an electron going here with no energy exchange, with no interaction with the surroundings, that's what you'd call pure mechanics. Whereas what happens at the ends, giving up heat, that's an entirely different branch of physics, thermodynamics. So physics, you know, these are two entirely different branches of physics that developed like 200 years apart. So mechanics came from, you know, planets, you know, Newton's laws, watching how the planets move in the sky, frictionless. And this is a very different branch of physics involving, which is driven by entropy. This is driven by force. And what makes transport so complicated is that these two things are mixed up. Because usually, you see, these things are all mixed up. But what makes this simple description possible in small devices is that because you're separating the two out. That's what leads to a nice, clean picture of things. And that's what leads you to simple formulas like this that I just wrote down, which you can get in just a few minutes. And I mean, someday, Tim Fisher in Mechanical engineering might tell you about how they're doing similar things with phonon transport. Instead of Fermi functions, you now have these Bose functions. And that also seems to be quite effective. Actually. Now, how do you think of big things? Well, big things you can think of as little elastic things in series where you go elastically for a while, lose some energy, Go elastically for a while, lose some energy. So that's kind of what I did. Because you see, I got this formula for conductivity, which I said is usually in chapter 15 of textbooks. 
And those are all referring to big conductors. But the reason I was able to get there quickly was it's kind of treating it like a small section like this and use all my arguments for that one. That's how I was getting done. So that's how I, what I feel is that this view is not only useful for small conductors, but also for big conductors if you know what you're doing, if you're using it clearly. Now what you might say is, okay, I understand that this is a good approximation to nano devices and you can use this, but isn't there a more rigorous way of doing all this? The answer is yes, there is a rigorous way. I mean, but what it means is you have to take mechanics and combine it with entropic forces. And in the context of classical mechanics, that's what Boltzmann did. That's kind of what took all of 19th century. That's what Boltzmann did. You see, that's the Boltzmann transport equation. Use it for all kinds of things. In the quantum con context, it's like Schrodinger equation. It's me quantum mechanics. It's still mechanics. You still have to put in the entropic forces. And when you put all that in, this is kind of what a lot of my research has been about over the years. That's this non-equilibrium green function method, which I'd say kind of does for quantum mechanics what the Boltzmann equation would do for classical mechanics, see? Now then you say, well, I've got this rigorous thing. Why do I do all these simple things then? Now that's where I guess the best answer I've seen is in Feynman's lectures. See, he put it very nicely. He says that, you know, even when you have all the math, unless you have a good picture it's really not much use. You cannot do very much with it. At the end of it, what you really need is a physical understanding. That's completely unmathematical, imprecise, and inexact. But that's how you actually can be creative about things. Now, I haven't seen people say this as clearly as Feynman, but I think many of you probably feel this in all everything you do. And so it's like, yeah, we believe in Boltzmann equation, but then when you think about it, we have some simple physical pictures. And the point I'm trying to make is that our usual physical picture is based on J equals sigma times the field in terms of the electrostatic potential. And the reason we use that is that's the th chapter one thing that we all grasp. That's the picture we carry in our head. And what I'm trying to say is that, well, there's an alternative physical picture that could be useful, at least in, a, in its own class of problems. See, that's all really. And, and the reason is, as I said, it's a, for nano devices, it's a good approximation. Even otherwise, it has the correct driving term. The thing is, the driving term is d mu dx rather than the field. Well, I guess I've come to the zeroth slide and I'm about to finish up. Yeah, thank you very much for your patience. So as I said, as what I was really trying to tell you is all the things that we have, what we have been doing kind of in the last 30 years, I'd say. And all the new understanding. And uh, as I said earlier, my own research has been largely about this, NEGF. And one of the things I found very useful is this elastic resistor approximation in terms of understanding this. This one is the benchmark. It's like, tells you mathematically what it is. But as I said, what I've discovered over the years is, yeah, it's very important to be able to think intuitively. And if you just use your intuition as it comes, you see most of the intuition is usually wrong. So what you have to do is first tune it with the real thing, you see? And then, but once you have tuned it, it's very effective. That's what I usually would say. And this has also been useful in terms of teaching. You see, back in the early 90s and all, I started this in the, the graduate course 659. And at that time, people said, you know, this is too advanced. You can't really teach it to graduate students. It's too hard. But this has always helped a lot, I'd say. And over the years, I guess, that was 19, 1990. Around 2000, then I said, well, looks like graduate students are doing fine. Maybe we'll try undergraduates. That's how the 453 and 595 developed. And then a couple of years back, we put it on NanoHub U just for anybody, essentially, where we said that the only prerequisite we'll require is what any student in science and engineering would have, just differential equations and matrix algebra. And so I've always found that, yeah, in terms of teaching, again, this has helped a lot. Because otherwise, it would be a lot of just mathematical things. But it's not just for teaching. The point I was trying to make is we are really need it for research as well. And for me, of course, right now, the main direction of research I'm involved with is this spin-related things. And that's where I was trying to point out this, that, yeah, this picture and this description, all this is kind of at the heart of what I'm doing in research also. 
Thank you very much. Professor Dada will uh, answer questions. As we go to the uh, subatomic scale, do you expect the framework to change very much? As we get even smaller dimensions, do you expect any new additions to the framework you already have developed? I would say that what I've seen here, yeah, actually worked at the atomic scale. So what I so roughly speaking, you see from this 30 years, the first 10 years was about an EGF in the context of semiconductors. Next 10 years were about molecular electronics, an EGF in the context of say current flow through a hydrogen molecule or things like that. And then the next last 10 years have been more about spin related things in all kinds of materials. Say. So kind of has, what I've seen in the atomic case also, very similar. <coughs> the main unanswered thing there would be what you call this strong correlations. And that is that, you see, electrons are very intera are interacting things. But what makes a simple theory possible is that you think of electrons as just non-interacting objects almost. But you say that the electron feels some average potential due to everything else. But otherwise, so that's this mean field theory. And our band, band theory, everything is based on that. And whatever description here, you know, any GF again, it's a full quantum theory. But then it's based on perturbation expansions and so on. So which kind of imply that the interactions are weak. Now there is some materials where there are evidence for strong correlations, which though I'd say is very much a frontier subject overall. Because people believe, you know, one of the biggest unsolved problems of condensed matter physics is the high TC superconductors, which were di discovered around 1986 or so, and still there is no accepted theory of what is happening. And th but everyone believes it's because it's a strongly correlated material. There's this strong interactions in narrow bands, etc. So that, in my mind, is the part I don't know, but what might work or what would be needed. But otherwise, most things I'd say. Yes. So where is the logic, where is the error in the following argument? There are two alternative pictures to look at the current transport. So there are two pictures that you can uh, use to describe the current transport. One based on electric fields and potentials. The other based on this electrochemical potential that you, uh, that you use. I would say that the first, in the first case, I don't care how far away I am from the equilibrium uh, as long as I capture the uh, distribution of uh, uh, fields and potentials correctly. In the second case, your electrochemical potential is in fact a thermodynamic quantity and therefore applicable only if you are reasonably close to the equilibrium. So in the first case, I don't care how far I am from the equilibrium. In the second case, I have to be close to the equilibrium. So the first approach is, by the, is therefore uh, stronger. Yeah, this, of course, we could discuss <laughs> for a while. <laughs> now, yeah, one thing is, I would say that much of what I'm talking about would be more in the context of close to equilibrium transport, which is what is relevant in most cases. <coughs> and you can use that at least in an approximate sense. So the point I was trying to make here is that when you're far from equilibrium, you always have Boltzmann equation. You can always go to that in the semi-classical context. Yeah, so classical. And here also you have the NEGF, right. which would go far from equilibrium. Yeah. So you could do that all. Right. This part is all to get an in intuition for it. I see. Okay. That is how I would justify this. And close to equilibrium, I'd say the intuition is yeah. very good that you get from here. Far from equilibrium, you have to be careful. So, you know, Mark's work is not based on nanotransistors, which are usually far from equilibrium, right? Okay. But he, you, you know, and then he uses this basis, but, but then it's still useful, still works. Still useful. That's what I mean. And yeah, the electric field thing yeah, could be useful in again a limited class of things. But the point I like to make is that yeah, the, what is really more basic is the J equals you know, minus this sigma d mu dx. And not the one that is this d phi dx. Because usually what we do is in class we say that 
you know, this can be written as this plus uh, something else. Then you call this the drift term and that the diffusion term. Yeah, that's kind of okay. But then if you had a non-homogeneous material, you'd have other terms you have to put in there. But the part you can, but how do you get those other terms? Well, you start from here. And then you see what you can do. But this is really basic. Just as heat flow being proportional to dt dx is basic. T and U as long as you have T. As long as you have T right there. And now when you go inside, that's where inside the material is out of equilibrium, that's where the quasi formula will thing comes in. That even when you are out of equilibrium, what I'd argue is that under the right conditions, a quasi formula will can be very useful. So that is what I was trying to go to. Yeah, things like this. That in ballistic transport, it's like, yeah, sure, all your northbound lanes are full, southbound lanes are empty. So it's way out of equilibrium. But the idea of a quasi temperature is then very useful. But your contacts are in the equilibrium. Contacts are. And I want to break that as well. Right, but somewhere there will be a contact. I see. Yes, so, that you right. so for example, in nanotransistors, these days people <coughs> worry about whether the source and drain regions are really in equilibrium or not. In that case, the real contact is the solder somewhere else. Yeah. But the source and drain could be a little out of equilibrium. Too. That's fine. But conceptually, there has to be a contact somewhere. Yeah. Any other questions? Burning one. Okay, well, let's thank Professor Barrow.